Hello, welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. This is an episode that's going to be part of season two of uh, Everyday Anarchism, uh, although I'm still in 2022. So we're recording this far out before when you're hearing it, dear listeners. This is all new and I'm still figuring it out. And for that reason, uh, I've asked Leonard Williams, who is a friend of the podcast and did a wonderful episode earlier to come for this very first inaugural recording of a season two episode. Leonard, thank you for coming back to Everyday Anarchism. I'm happy to be back with you. It's always fun to talk with you. All right. Well, we are doing uh, an episode today on Voltaire de Clare, who um, is a very interesting and mostly neglected figure in the American anarchist tradition and someone who I knew almost nothing about, but have been reading up on some of her work and find myself just uh, amazed. So thank you for coming to, uh, to help us shed some light on this neglected figure. I'm happy to do so, and uh, in many ways I had a similar reaction upon reading her work for the first time and then teaching it to students and then exploring it further on my own. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm so glad. It's always a pleasure to, to teach these texts and see, what, see how the students respond. It gives me so many new ideas. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So the... Um, the text that I will have a recording of in a previous episode is uh, the one I picked was America, uh, Anarchism and American Traditions. But before we get into that, could you tell us, I know Walter and Claire is often compared to Emma Goldman in that they are both women, prominent women in the anarchist movement, and then there's key differences. One of them is immigrant, one of them is American born, et cetera. So can you briefly sketch Voltaire and Claire's life, and I think intersections with Emma Goldman is is one of the key places where where we'll need to go. Okay, definitely. Um, Voltaire and Claire was born in Michigan, a small town, I think, close to Lansing. I'm not sure of the exact location. Um, in 1866, um, she grew up in a family where her father was a free thinker, and I think. Uh, kind of a lapsed Catholic in many ways. Um, he named her Voltairine because he admired Voltaire, obviously, uh, and then uh, did a number on her. At, at the age of 13, sent her off to a Catholic convent for schooling in Ontario. And uh, she did not like that at all, escaped a few times. Ended up graduating, though. It's hard to imagine um, Voltaire liking having been sent to a Catholic convent either. So I mean, that makes sense, fitting with her namesake. To be sure. Um, so, and uh, shortly after graduating from high school um, in her early 20s, became involved with the free thought movement as a writer and then as a popular lecturer. Um, it's hard to call her a, an orator because she wasn't one who was intent on reaching people emotionally necessarily. She wasn't an agitator. She wasn't a natural speaker in the way that Emma Goldman was, say. Um, but she was very clear-minded, very thoughtful in how she presented her ideas. And so she lectured quite frequently on behalf of free thought. And the free thought movement was simply uh, a movement for rationalism, um, opposed to religion, opposed to um, custom, opposed to received ideas. And it was all about thinking for yourself and coming to your own conclusions. She didn't come to anarchism right away. Um, and in fact, as she tells the story, in one of her essays on uh, Haymarket, when she first read the headlines about anarchists bombing uh, a crowd in Haymarket Square, she thought th those anarchists should hang. Mm -hmm. Of course, they eventually did. But shortly after having that thought uh, and saying that aloud, um, she came to anarchism very quickly thereafter learned that they were set up, that they were punished for their beliefs and not for anything that they had actually done, um, had heard a lecture by uh, Charles Darrow, um, and Clarence Darrow, excuse me, um, and he converted her to socialism, 
she argued as a socialist against an anarchist and realized that she was wrong. <laughs> and so became a convinced anarchist and got mentored uh, by Dyer Lum. Um, not a name that I know much about, but I know he was very active in anarchist circles at this time. And then eventually became a very, again, popular writer and popular speaker um, in the anarchist movement at this early stage. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I mean, the one thing that I want to stop at this point and talk a, a little bit about, I really enjoyed your description of free thinking. So in, in season one, an episode that will have come out long before this airs, but it hasn't come out just yet as we are recording. I uh, did an episode on Turgenev's novel, uh, Fathers and Children, which introduces mm -hmm. nihilism to the world. And, um, you know, Emma Goldman in some of her work tries to separate anarchism from nihilism. Kropotkin seems much more to accept that anarchism uh, is, is sort of springs out of nihilism. And when the uh, when the when the conservative figure in that novel, the the uncle of one of the main characters, Pavel Petrovich, confronts the nihilist, he says, so "You don't believe in anything." And the nihilist Bazarov says, "I mean, sort of, but really, it just means we want to negate whatever is there to clear ground for something new." So that's sort of the narrative I'm hearing from Voltaire and Declare. You start off with free thinking, which is not a a doctrine or a set of ideas, but just a conviction that whatever already exists should be questioned. And then you mm -hmm. go through this nihilist arc, and then you come out on the other side as as an anarchist after experimenting with socialism. We could we could say that's Kropotkin's narrative. That seems like a pretty traditional uh, anarchist narrative, free thought to socialism to anarchism. Does that sound right? Yeah, and I, I think what underlies all of those is that spirit of revolt, that spirit of questioning, uh, what Marx called a ruthless criticism of everything existing, right? So anarchists, socialists, free thinkers, and the rest all decided that what really needed to be done was for people to take the matters into their own hands, uh, to kind of find their own path in life, um, and challenge all those orthodoxies uh, that oppress us, imprison us, that constrict the possibilities that we have before us. And Voltaire Declare was, was no different. So many of her early heroes in that free thinking period were people like Thomas Paine, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Mary Wollstonecraft, William Godwin, right? all people in that rational enlightenment phase who were attacking the older orders of church and then later of the state as well. Excellent. Yeah, it's one thing, and I know we talked about the, the 60s a little bit last time you were on the show, which is a decade that I, that I did not live through. But when I'm, when I'm reading about the 1850s and 1860s and you're talking about the spirit of revolt, it sounds to me like the Beats, the Hippies, the SDS, and a little bit later, Punks, and even, you know, in my, in my day, what we had were, were Goths, and they were certainly nihilists in their own way. And it's these cultures, often made up of young people, of like, look, I don't know what the answer is, but whatever you're selling me, I can tell is bullshit. And so <laughs> this, this, this youthful spirit of revolt, and there's probably a really traditional narrative that this was invented uh, in the 1950s by, you know, Kerouac or something like that. And what right. we're seeing is this is not this, this <laughs> spirit of youthful revolt and counterculture at least goes back 100 years more. Than oh, this. certainly, certainly. And you you get in the late 1800s and the early 20th century, this uh, bohemian culture that develops in the urban areas and people like Voltaire de Clare eventually gravitate toward that. She spent most of her life living in Philadelphia, but also spent time in London uh, and in Chicago and many other places where she would have been in contact with people. It's probably a good place to come back to your question about Emma Goldman and her relationship. Clearly, they were among a group of anarchist feminists, of anarchist women, there's an excellent book, by the way, by Margaret Marsh called Anarchist Women, 1870 to 1920, that features um, discussions of 
of the radical feminism of these early anarchists. And Goldman and Declare had a great deal of respect for one another. They worked on many projects together. They were running in the same circles. Yet they were also also in competition with one another, right? They had um, people were kind of pitting them <laughs> against one another. You know, it was kind of like the same, going back to the 60s metaphors, you know, the same tension that the culture had between Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, right? They were kind of pitting them against one another in many ways, comparing them constantly. And folks did the same with Goldman and, and Declare. You know, you mentioned that they were seen as different because Goldman was an immigrant, and of course, Declare is a native born American. Um, they were different in their temperament. Goldman, very much the extrovert, very much the orator, the agitator, um, out there, larger than life, you know, and declare of shy, retiring, uh, moody, uh, dark, taciturn is, is the phrase that Goldman used to describe her. Um, so they were very different in, in temperament, very different in politics. Goldman, very much the anarcho-communist. Declare still had more of that individualist, um, or at least mutualist kind of orientation. So she was a little bit more respectful of the idea of property than Goldman was, to be sure. So in all of these ways, they were different and competitors. Yet at the same time, they were very much in tune with one another and seeing that the dominant idea that the cause of anarchism was bigger than both of them. And so they didn't let necessarily let it get in the way of uh, respect for one another, cooperating with one another, collaborating with one another to the extent possible. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that, that that's a really good uh, encapsulation of the differences between them. I will admit in my own rather brief reading, the similarities between them seem much seem much larger than the differences, even though I know that they're traditionally um, opposed in that same way. Uh, and it, th this is a narrative that we've heard a lot lately about um, King and Malcolm X, that right. are there enormous, I mean, there's enormous differences between those two men, but there, there's also much, much greater, there's much, much greater similarities. I mean, one of them called uh, America a burning, burning building, and that was not Malcolm X. That was Martin Luther <laughs> King who called America a burning building. So uh, you, you can put them together more in a way that people have it necessarily. Um, excellent. I guess the one last question I have uh, is, I know Voltaire and Declare died relatively young, and so I'm wondering, and it seems like there was a certain amount of uh, engagement with her work after she died. So I'm wondering where she where she fits in this in this narrative as the you know the narrative that's been unspooling in this anarchism one of one series that the the golden age of anarchism sort of runs for about fifty years you know from around 1870 to 1920 or or so and then after after that things are things are different. So where does she fit into this historical arc? She's um, very much in the center of that golden age. Um, she eventually meets Kropotkin on one of her trips to London, for example. But um, because Haymarket was such a tremendous influence upon her that brought her to anarchism in the first place, um, she made a point of coming back every November 11th to Chicago to give a speech to give a talk on the occasion of the um, murder by the state and um, came back every year without fail. Um, her writings were widely published in Mother Earth, the magazine that Emma Goldman and others were publishing at the time. So she was kind of front and center in, in many ways during this period. But again, there were these differences. And one of the problems that she had was that she was kind of living hand to mouth, um, you know, trying to make a small living as a teacher of immigrants, uh, largely Jewish immigrants in Philadelphia, 
So she wasn't making a lot of money, to be sure. She had poor health, um, and she had been shot by a former student of hers in 1902. There's a story around there as well where it reveals something of her character because she refused to cooperate, didn't want her assailant punished, prosecuted, raised money for his defense, didn't refuse to have, refused to name him uh, to the police. Um, and so, but that complicated things because she carried some of the shrapnel with her for some time. And so over time, her health deteriorated. She had uh, incredible ringing in her ears, noises that she said sounded like a locomotive. And by the age of 45 in 1912, she passed away. Two years later, uh, Alexander Berkman, whom she had helped uh, edit his uh, prison memoirs, edited a, a collection of her work. Uh, they had a special issue devoted to her in, in Mother Earth. Um, and then afterward, kind of fades from the scene. Um, her bio, there's a really excellent biography of Paul Average, uh, an American anarchist that was published in the 1970s that still remains kind of the go-to book about her, um, where folks can read more about her and, and, and get a sense of the kind of life she was living throughout this period. But as, as we noted at the outset, you know, over time she became less well-known and very, very few people uh, today even still know a lot about her or encountered her work or written about her. Seems like every time somebody writes about her, they have to preface it with saying she's very little known. She ought to be known better. <laughs> yeah, it does. Say, there's there's often this sort of there there can be only one phenomenon uh, or or at most two in the case of someone like King and X, where you have these two figures to oppose one another. And it just seems like Emma Goldman, if there's one anarcho-feminist, it is Emma Goldman. And that is, you know, she gets to be in all the anthologies and that is that is the end of the story. Um, so I want to transition now. Um, I, we need to go back and discuss these ideas, which should be the bulk of this episode. But I want to talk about um, where I see the value of, of Volterine Declare. Um, and I'm going to do this a bit anecdotally, and you can tell me if you think I'm way off. But I, I, I've seen, you know, when, when you look at people like... Uh, Glenn Greenwald and Edward Snowden, and, and I've seen people on the far left supporting Putin's war on Ukraine, and there seems to be this sort of narrative out there that just the worst thing that exists in the world is America. I mean, you do, do you know what I'm talking about, this, mm -hmm. this narrative? And if there is, in, in the same way that Kropotkin wanted the Germans, wanted sort of World War I to happen, and for the Germans to lose, because he thought German militarism was bad, and I am with him that German militarism was bad, but he was able to overlook all the complexities of the situation in the sense of like, there is an evil empire and it must be destroyed. I see that in certain circles today in, in the 21st century, that people would rather have Vladimir Putin or Hugo Chavez than than a powerful and strong America. And as much as I am against an, an, an American empire or an empire in, in any form, it seems to me that this is a very distressing development. I'm, I'm a historian of American ideas and I see the idea of America as a libertarian, a liberatory and anarchist tradition, or at least I want it to be. And I'm in a conflicted moment, then. so I thought I might talk talk to you about this. And firstly, like, does this does this conflict make sense to you? I mean, you, we could, you could be very schematic and say uh, there's the Declaration of Independence, which is the good America, and the Constitution, which is the bad America. I don't want to be quite that simplistic, but perhaps that's that's some place that Voltaire Declare goes, for example. So now I've thrown in a bunch of stuff. So if you well, if you she doesn't quite it. she doesn't quite go that far, although you know. William Lloyd Garrison does explicitly, Frederick Douglass does in many ways. But it's amazing, and I discovered that, again, while teaching Declare in the context of teaching about American political thought, is that 
very frequently the most radical people come back to those basic ideals. Um, and there are probably a couple of reasons for that. One is they're still valid ideas of reason, minimal government, if at any government at all, um, popular sovereignty, things like that sort, the kinds of ideals that Declare talks about in this essay. Um, but also the idea is to just use those ideals, use that heritage, that tradition to try to reach the people that they need to reach. Um, Emma Goldman did much the same. Certainly Declare does that even more explicitly, is to try to link the radical tradition, the anarchist tradition, that they imbibed, that they inhabited with the American revolutionary tradition, the American radical tradition, as a way of showing that it's okay to be radical, right? It's not a scary thing. It's not a foreign doctrine, this anarchism or radicalism or the revolutionary spirit. Um, the folks who wrote the Port Huron Statement of SDS, they did much the same thing to try to create a, a new, genuine American radicalism. This is how I think ideological change happens, is that if you're going to confront an orthodoxy, it sometimes does you little good to confront it head on. Mm. You need to pick the elements of that orthodox tradition that can support you so that you can speak the language that people understand that people have already had. You know, Gramsci talked about it in terms of common sense, right? So you've got you to talk to people where they are and try to bring them along. Um, and that's what I, I think is important for us as radical thinkers to acknowledge about our radicalism that we, if, if we're going to reach people that don't already believe what we believe, we have to connect with them somehow. And one way of connecting them is with this radical tradition in the American experience. I love, I love this idea. So something in the back of my mind when I was blathering is, you know, trending on social media where you and I are recording this on July 14th on Bastille Day, a revolutionary day. And 10 days ago, there was, you know, another revolutionary day or a day that I would like to be revolutionary. And then in my anarchist circles was, was trending this narrative fuck the fourth was was the slogan. A lot of the publishers had fuck the fourth sales. And to, to go back to, to, to my life, I recall that uh, that song, Proud to be an American and, and Desert Storm and Fireworks and Jingoism and, and, and Chauvinism of the worst, most disgusting kind that at age eight or whatever I was totally swept up in. And in that sense, I don't want to suggest that, <laughs> that fuck Fuck that shit, right? Like that that narrative is completely true. But precisely as you say, I'm much more amenable. Instead of saying fuck the fourth, say, in fact, the fourth was awesome insofar as it was a revolutionary moment. And we can go back to these revolutionary ideals and find actually America, what people are calling America is not at all what America was meant or or could have been. And that's where, and that's where you reach people. And so when you let something like the Gadsden flag become a symbol of white supremacy, I, un I understand why you <laughs> want to fly the Gadsden flag because it's become associated with white supremacy. But I would rather say, actually, you know, those, those guys have it have it all wrong. And, and I, I like the slogan, don't tread on me. And I like the idea of join or die and confederation and all this stuff and the, the, the lee greenwood version of america is actually incompatible with the version of america that i that i yeah. and Voltrine declare gives us that she she does in in this essay in, in many ways it is like douglas's what to the slave is the fourth of july or eugene deb's speech for, that's associated with the fourth of july in anarchism and american traditions declare wants to start by reviewing U.S. history. She talks about religious rebellion, right? The re rebellion against religious orthodoxy, I should say. She talks about the revolution of 1776. 
you know, Paine, Jefferson, that whole spirit of rational revolt. And then she talks about its eventual creation of government, even though as an anarchist, she doesn't want any government at all. She does recognize that at the end, what they were hoping for was government is what she calls a serviceable agent. You know, government small enough, nimble enough to kind of help people do what they need to do collectively. But then <laughs> everything gets lost, right? And so the other part of her story is that the Republican spirit that was present in those early years has dissipated, right? There's been what, as a political theorist, we might call a loss of civic virtue because government gets established, gets um, institutionalized, and so it develops an interest apart from the people. It becomes detrimental to liberty, you know, all of the critique of the state that as anarchists we're familiar with. She sees human nature getting corrupted uh, by a focus on ease and luxury. <laughs> you know, we start to get rich uh, and as a people generally, and um, we forget what it's like uh, to be needing more autonomy, more liberty. We develop commerce and manufacture and you know, that just leads to materialism and debt and to imperialism. You know, so she's, you know, just like Marx before her talking about globalization um, in 1908, just as we talk about it now and all the detrimental impacts that it has then as well as now. Um, so that's the history here. We started out with this revolutionary spirit we see an inevitable decline for a variety of reasons. And the goal that she has is to try to find some way to re reawaken that spirit of liberty, that spirit of rebellion, um, what she calls the, the dare spirit. The, you know, willingness to dare, to do, to, to invent. Excellent. And, that, and, and for her, that is if not the only American tradition, that is the, in some ways, the first American tradition and the American tradition that is, that is worth, that is worth keeping around. And she does do a great job of showing, she does less work with Emerson in this um, mm -hmm. than, than I would, although she writes about Emerson in other places. Her focus really is on the 18th century. The, 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 you know, they're called the founding fathers, although she wouldn't, wouldn't like that term. That's not a very anarchistic term, but the idea that these men Jefferson and Payne especially wanted this spirit of revolt to be part of the country's, uh, I don't want to say DNA, that's a, that's a narrative, a, a metaphor <laughs> I don't like, but to be part of the country's civic virtue precisely. And the spirit of revolt is, is the opposite of commerce, manufacture, imperialism, bureaucracy, following rules, et, et cetera. And so she's attempting to declare these things un-American, even though they, they are what is Coca-Cola and Vietnam and the Vietnam War are what has be, been coded as American for for people in the late 20th and early 21st century. But that's not her reading of America. No, no. And um, indeed, what she finds is that although we have lost our way, we can recover it by returning to what might be regarded as a more genuine Americanism which she identifies with anarchism. Yes. So, the so the Republican spirit of the 18th century is the same as the anarchistic spirit because they share a lot in common. She shows their unity uh, or at least similarities here. They share ideals of equal liberty, right? They share skepticism of government rather than confidence in it. Uh, they favor popular sovereignty, the supremacy of the people, ultimately, that collectively we should determine our fate and nobody else should be doing that. Now, I'll give a long quote here. She says that they share, quote, the recognition that the little must precede the great, that the local must be the basis of the general, that there can be a federation only where there are free communities to federate, 
that the spirit of the latter is carried into the councils of the former, and a local tyranny may thus become an instrument for general enslavement. That's a passage from that essay, but it again highlights that in her mind, in the context of this essay, the republicanism, the revolutionary spirit of 1776 is the same as the anarchist spirit of the 1890s and the early 20th century. Yeah, and I'm, I, I want to stress how much the local is the thing that matters in in America. I discussed this uh, a great deal with James Fallows when I had him on the show, the Atlantic mm -hmm. writer and the really journalistic historian of America. When we when we look at America as a set of monumental Roman style buildings in you know one city on the Potomac, we are really we are really looking at it from the, you know, the wrong end of the telescope. America is supposed to be a bunch of small, self-sustaining, self-governing communities that have come together to build something bigger, not a bunch of isolated places which are, uh, you know, held by a central sovereign. But that is, you know, so now the, ne the next place that I was trying to say what I was going to go, but I'll plug into it. This is something that I've been working on this whole time, the whole January 6th issue, where I, when I look at the narrative around January 6th, and it's like, well, those people, the, 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 the people who did the stupid coup, they were horrible, and I disagree with everything that they stand for. But then the other people who say, like, well, you can't do that. You can't, you can't storm the seat of power at Washington D.C. Please put more machine guns around the seat of power in Washington D.C. And like I, 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 if these are my two options, count, count me out. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to go become an anarchist. If the option <laughs> is, you know, an imperial building garden with machine guns, or a populist white supremacy. There has to be a, a different option. I, yeah. I refuse to let these be my only two options. And Voltrine Declare, I feel like, de delivers it. Uh, definitely, definitely. But the remarkable thing about her, though, like, again, like Emma Goldman in many respects, is that she isn't just focused on these traditions and discussions about government. She is showing how personal autonomy is what's really at issue, mm -hmm. right? That that personal autonomy is not only the means for self-development and ultimately social progress, but it's also central to a feminist understanding of social life. And her writings coming out of that feminist spirit, her essay on sex slavery, her essay on the woman question, all of those pieces read like they were written yesterday, mm -hmm. especially in the aftermath of the overturning of Roe versus Wade by the Supreme Court. I'll, I'll give a quote from her essay on sex slavery, two quotes actually. And that is the vilest tyranny where a man compels a woman he loves to endure the agony of bearing children that she does not want, and for whom, as is the rule rather than the exception, they cannot properly provide. It is worse than any other human oppression. Again, it sounds like it could be written um, uh, yesterday. Yeah. And then she writes as well, the earth is a prison, the marriage bed is a cell, women are the prisoners, and you are the keepers. So she is, in her own life, she is a person who is struggling for that autonomy, doesn't want to be controlled by anyone, wants to pursue the construction of her own life, and remarkably is thoroughgoing and letting other people make those decisions for themselves. She is far from telling anyone what kind of anarchist to be. Right? She is very much in, in the spirit of that notion of anarchy, anarchism rather, without adjectives. Even though she had been largely an individualist rather than a communist, um, initially more pacifist than focused on direct action, she's a very eclectic spirit 
and embraces that all and sees the value in all of these various perspectives, uh, which just makes her a remarkable thinker and a remarkable human being as well. Yes, and those those quotes are so are so relevant, and and again, they they suggest to me that we are having the wrong the wrong fight right now. If we on the left, if our goal is to could take back control of the Supreme Court. That is that is a mistake. The goal should be to, you know, defeat, neuter, destroy, eliminate, reduce the Supreme Court as much as possible. That's where you get autonomy, not with uh, not with a seat of power that is on the same side as as you. And I will, I will only briefly mention the Soviet Union without going into it. But that is the that 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 is the thing that that, that anarchism I think has guards well against this idea that, oh, if only we have the right people in that seat of power, in the room where it happens, we will get the right outcome. Because the result will be loss of autonomy in any which way you slice it. And I think Declare is right. W women are going to bear the brunt of that loss of autonomy, no matter right. who is taking that power. Right. And she saw the connections between her own life and the efforts to control her, the efforts to punish her. Uh, she had a child out of wedlock, never married, um, struggled to, again, make ends meet, to kind of make her own way in the world as, a, as an individual human being. And she took from that not a sense that she was better than someone, but a, a great empathy for people who were suffering. And of all the characteristics that people who knew her wrote about her, it was that sense that she was tremendously empathetic, tremendously caring about other people. Um, and that animated her, her writing and I think her commitment to the anarchist ideal. Okay. This, the place we need to go now, because I think we've, we've done a really good job of, of fitting this into the picture, is education. This is another place where... You know, it seems to me that anarchism has the right answer and that Declare does a great job with it, but it doesn't fit into our current left-right narrative. So um, I am an educator, you are an educator, we are both definitely pro-education, but um, Declare argues, I think quite persuasively, that while public education is absolutely vital, education in the, uh, in the American system is is a form of tyranny, and I, I as, despite being an educator, happen to uh, agree with her. And so, if the choice is, you know, are you for or against education? This is this is the wrong choice. You must be for education, but the right kind of education. And one of the things she talks about in, uh, you know, uh, anarchism and American traditions is that the key one of the key roles of American education is to eliminate appreciation for the spirit of revolt that mm -hmm. animated the creation of the country that is educating these children. Very much so. I mean, she clearly believed that education was a means for social progress, a means to remind people of the value of rationality, of of thinking things through, of solving your own problems, but it had to be non-authoritarian. It had to be learning by doing. So you, she was very much an advocate of, and worked with many of the people in the modern school movement of that period. Obviously, I think had great sympathy for the Dewey and project, even though she obviously didn't know about it yet, right? Um, you know, very much of that, very much in the spirit of education that liberates rather than constrains. Good, yeah. So this is this this comes up in this moment where she and this is this is where I you know do my confession is uh, she talks about how when figures like Washington and Lincoln are taught and the Shays Rebellion they are taught as brief object lessons or, or the even the creation of the Constitution brief object lessons for why it is important for a strong central power in the United States. And so the spirit of questioning, what were those farmers, uh, 
rebelling against and were the taxes they were rebelling against similar to the taxes that were <laughs> imposed in the 1760s and 1770s this is not part of the american <laughs> education all rebellions are good until the constitution is uh, imposed and after that all rebellions are bad and that you know, <laughs> that that is the sense in that we should fuck the fourth but that is not the sense that she thinks uh the the, the american revolution could and should be taught in in schools and that seems to me the thing that she's most aiming at in public school system is it's a form of nine monarchical um indoctrination the president is good and right and powerful and do not question the president and please don't ever consider that what happened on July 4th could ever, ever happen again. Very much so. And she clearly wants the kind of education that not only gives you the, the historical and cultural and rational tools to find your own way, but she wants them to, wants an education that encourages that, develops it, um, nurtures it. Um, and most education doesn't. Most education is, you know, a, using Friari's idea of that banking model where you just kind of put stuff in and regurgitate it out later, or is designed by the powers that be to promote an orthodoxy, promote a particular point of view. The debates about education going on in the United States at this time with everybody focused on things like um, critical race theory, which is just a label for anything they don't like, and, and so forth and so on, right? These would have been debates that Declare would have been very much involved in and reminding everybody at every chance she had that we should not be trying to find and invent new ways of stifling people stifling that spirit of revolt, stifling that spirit of inquiry, we should be nurturing it instead. Yeah, wonderful. And again, as someone who who was doing high school education during the height of some of these debates about CRT and the 1619 Project, I again wanted to take the sort of anarchist position. I mean, I was somewhat unpopular with my colleagues because I would say things like, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I think is bullshit in the 1619 Project. But again, it's this, it's this binary thing. I mean, I took myself personally, to be attacking the 1619 Project from the left and finding it a bit too regressive, a bit too essentialist. The historian Nell Irvin Painter, this is this was her argument. And that's the kind of thing that I think Beaupre and Declare would love, but that was that that was not uh, an, an, an allowable option in this by you, you know, you either were against racism. Um, or you were for racism. Those were the <laughs> those were the, those were the two options. When you draw those hard lines, you get students who come into your classroom knowing that they are on one side and the 1619 project is on the other, and they will not listen to you. Whereas if they, with an open mind, explored the founding of the United States of America, you might get a very very different. Yeah, I, th I think in many ways when we fall into these binaries, um, these competing positions of contradiction and denial and gainsaying, it's very, very easy for that to become very rigid. It's almost like you're in a cylinder here that you can't break out of. The spirit of revolt that Declare is talking about, that anarchists, I think, represent, comes at it more obliquely. It's like coming at it from a different angle altogether, disrupting that that cylindrical constraint and saying, no, you've got to think about it from a from an alternate standpoint. You've got to think about it in terms of both and you have to think about it in terms of possibilities that are left ignored, that are not acknowledged. Um, and that's what Declare keeps coming back to. It's the idea that we need to recognize that there are values that are not being acknowledged, that there are principles that are not being recognized, and it's time we pay attention to those. Yeah, and I would say the six, something like the 1619 Project precisely comes from that oblique way of 
thinking about American history. The problem is that once that kind of thinking is done by academics and professionals, they want people want that to be codified for students rather than letting students do that same sort of oblique thinking for themselves. And now I'll direct anyone who wants to listen to my John Dewey episode because I, I have discussed this at, at, at length. That's, but that's the problem, a prepackaged version of America a prepackaged version of America that acknowledges its racism is way better than a prepackaged version of America that doesn't. But the goal is to move away from a prepackaged version of America in the schools. At all, yes. Um, and that, again, I think is an important part of the, the thing that I like about Declare's writing and her approach to things is that she does acknowledge that the battles that we have to kind of open people's minds to free possibilities for self-development and social progress are never ending. Mm -hmm. You know, she is hopeful, um, but she's not uh, Pollyanna. Uh, she doesn't allow herself to think that everything's going to be better if, if only we kind of change the leaders or if only we you know, win the eight hour day or whatever it might be, that there's always going to be more and there's always um, room for continued action, continued direct action, which for her just simply means asserting your rights, standing up for yourself, claiming the autonomy that's due you as a, as a human being. Wonderful. We've now hit as we're drawing to a close almost everything I wanted to talk about but we also, now that we've gotten into to the topic of race and the 1619 Project, and I mentioned Lincoln, the, the last thing, and this is something that declares it as a jumping off point, and I also thought that you as a, as a political theorist who has been working for decades on these topics, it seems to me that the spirit of revolt in the United States right now has been co-opted by the right wing. And I think this goes back. So Jefferson is a great emblem for Declare. And Jefferson was a plantation owner and, and rapist. And someone like Abraham Lincoln did more than anyone else to expand the power of the federal government in a way that, you know, is monarchical, is bad from an anarchist point of view. But obviously he did so in pursuit. Well, this is somewhat complicated, but broadly speaking, in pursuit of a vision of freedom and i see in the united states perhaps uniquely but at least unusually in the landscape of 21st century politics uh, a, a narrative that personal autonomy or the language and rhetoric of freedom and autonomy is tied to right-wing goals and i wanted to see if you thought that is, is, is true with your wider experience of political theory? And if you think that that is, uh, is, is like I do, tied into race and slavery and the federal government and that uh, the, the federal government's in some ways uh, liberalizing place in, in American polity over the past 200 years, even as we see something like uh, the current Supreme Court reminds us what a tenuous... Uh, hold we have on, quote, power, quote, we. Right. I, I think the first place to start is that that period of the Supreme Court as a advocate for individual liberty and racial equality and the like, that was a very short period <laughs> yes. of, of but time. The, but the, 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 in the broader sweep, the federal government has often been on, quote, the right side of history and the administrative state, I'm thinking of the New Deal, has often been the, you know, the quote, good, good guys. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. The, and the spirit of revolt so often has been captured by, by the other side. Well, it's important, I think, for people like us uh, to remember that there is other side of that story that could be told, right? That the spirit of revolt in the American experience isn't the property of any one party or any one sect 
or any one predisposition or any one ideology. It's there for all of us to take as our own, to shape it in a narrative, to tell that story in ways that advance the causes that we believe in. The right in late 20th century, early 21st century US has been more skillful at telling that story from their point of view. Um, this is, I, I think, a, a Gramscian kind of story, right? A story of hegemonic contest between various ideologies for people who want to try to shape the culture before they take the reins of power and use it to their advantage. There was a time, and I think certainly the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the early feminist movement, et cetera, the, everything we know as the 60s, um, when it was the radicals who were beginning to tell that narrative and you know, use the symbols of the American Revolution to their own effect. Um, that's gone because in many ways, um, times have changed and people moved on. And I think very evidently the right learned the lessons from the left. They learned about sit-ins. They learned about protests. They learned about occupations, right? The tools that we have for social and political change, again, are not the property of any one group. They're there for the taking. Um, and it's up to those who want to pursue a particular goal to decide how best to use them and what tactics are appropriate and also what story to tell. Um, every political action is part of a narrative and um, we need to be more skillful then if we're interested in promoting the ideals that Bolter and Declare puts forward, we have to be able to tell that narrative uh, more effectively than, than we've been um, over the last couple of decades or so. Wonderful. I think that's a fantastic way of putting it. I am completely sympathetic to her project of putting it in the language of American traditions. And that doesn't, of course, that's not the only way, that's not the only way to do it, but this is, this is where you started, right? Is the project is to convince people that um, the, the world they want to live in is the one that you are articulating. And so if they've got a sense of a belief in the American traditions, showing them, as I personally believe, that many of the American traditions are compatible with, with anarchism seems to me the, the way to go. Although if you wanna burn the flag, by all means burn the flag. That's I'm, I, I, the last thing I would ever want is to pass a law forbidding the burning of the flag. I just don't think that's the most productive way uh, to, to win this battle. Right, yeah, I, I think um, it comes down to a simple, recognition that if you want to persuade Americans, you have to talk them like Americans. If you want to persuade the French, we'll be talking about Bastille Day and not about July 4th, 1776. And I mean, the other option is to convince people that they should convince Americans that they should give up the idea of America. And that seems to me not only nigh impossible, but simply not necessary. We have a ready-made radical tradition that we can fly the American flag over, even though I'm not really super into flag flying. Yeah, it, to be sure. And I think it, it's very similar to what I've read with, in the context of a lot of discussion about how to deal with partisan and ideological polarization, is that you get nowhere by kind of hitting people over the head confronting them directly and gainsaying what they believe. You get a lot further 
when you point to shared values, when you point to shared understandings of the world, to the extent that you can. I mean, there are no guarantees in any of this. <laughs> but to the extent that you can, you've got to reach people where they are and try to move them in the direction that you want them to go. Wonderful. Um, I, I would say we could leave it at that, but I do think we, uh, at this point, the listeners are going to be wondering, I think we need to acknowledge the third uh, member of our conversation. Would you mind introducing your, your dog so they know oh. who, who's been moaning? <laughs> his, his name is Louis, short for Lewin, um, uh, inspired by the movie Inside Lewin Davis, you know, uh, but he's a Sealy Ham Terrier, uh, so we chose a Welsh sounding name for him um and i would show him to everyone but they will, they will not be able to see <laughs> so um my dog dashel has definitely made himself heard on the podcast before and uh kathy o'neill's dog i believe was involved in our conversation but i don't believe that made it onto the audio so uh -huh. uh, I, I believe lewin is only the second dog to actually have uh, made themselves heard in the podcast that they <laughs> will will not be the last dog. And I'm sure Dasha will be showing up soon enough. Um, I'm, I'm sure his um, bodily clock is telling him it's dinner time. So that's probably <laughs> what's going on. Okay. Well, I, I don't want probably to the, the the that clock that we need to, to, to tell us we've talked for too long. It's yes. time to end. Yes, it wasn't, wasn't that nice of him to let us know. Leonard, thank you so much. You were uh, one of my very first guests on this show. Thank you so much for your support of the show. It's been such a pleasure. It's been a delight. I wish you well.